To be born. How many know he didn't have to do that today? He didn't have to do that. And I'm so grateful for that song that Phil just just played because it goes with my message today. I address our internet family who's watching also to this message goes out to you. You're our family who does not be here wherever you are in this world today. This message goes to you. I want to give you this very short message today to the point, and I'm going to let you go home. And the Lord just gave me these few words to give you just to know why he's the reason for the season. In this Christmas season, I'm so grateful today that the Lord has truly blessed us again to see this season. You may be watching on mygladtidings.org. I'm grateful that the Lord has blessed you to see this year come and this Christmas season. The song that Phil just uh, just played was talking about the manger and the Savior. I want to address to you and ask this question, why was the Savior of the world laid in a manger? Why was the Savior of the world laid in a manger? In a manger, and I asked the Lord, What do you want me to preach on this? And he gave me the words Luke 2 1 through 7. We're going to be in that today. And it says this, and it states this. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Canarius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was in the house of the lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning. Thank you again for this Christmas season, for the message that you gave me to give to your wonderful people here and outside of this house. Father, I honor you because of who you are today and coming down to this earth to be born to be our Savior. Thank you, Lord, for this Christmas season that we are embarking today. And I pray for those who are watching today that they be encouraged by this message. I pray for those in this house be encouraged also. And I thank you, Father, for this word that we're about to receive. Lord, I don't preach in my own strength, but I preach in yours. And I thank you, Father, for giving me the strength and touching these lips of clay to speak to your people and give me the honor to speak to this beautiful and wonderful church. Thank you for this church body, and we honor you and praise you. I love all these people, Father, but you love them even more. And we honor you and give thanks and praise. Amen. 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 Let me read the passage to you again. And I'll let you know where I'm going. Luke 2, 1 through 7 says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus from all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Canarius was governing Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, 
because he was of the house of lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was while they were there, the days were registered for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now the birth of Jesus is a time surrounded by many miracles. There's angelic appearances, a virgin conception. There was a split second timing as to the precise moment of his birth. I mean, the hand of God is highly visible in the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ in this, of the world, into this world. However, every time I look and read of the birth of the Lord Jesus, it never ceases to amaze me by the simple statement made in verse 7, which says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. To me, the thought that the King of kings and Lord of lords and the Savior of the world, our champion, would come to this world to be placed in a manger is almost beyond my level of thinking or comprehension. Every time I read that, I think about that. Have you ever thought about it? Well, think about it now. A manger is a feeding trough for farm animals. It wasn't a bad place for feeding the sheep or cattle. But to my mind, it was certainly no place for a baby to be placed, much less the Son of God. However, as I, as I think about this great truth, I realize, I realized this, that there were some pretty important reasons why Jesus was placed in a manger at his birth. This morning, I would like to take a few minutes and address this question. Why was a savior of the world placed in a manger? Verse 7 tells us again, it says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It plainly says that Jesus was placed in this makeshift cradle because there was no room available for him and his family in the end there in Bethlehem. Now, isn't it sad that when God came to earth to redeem sinners, men responded by putting up a no vacancy sign. Well, well things haven't changed much in 2,000 years or more after his birth. You know what? Things are still the same. No vacancies in our hearts, minds, and souls. Not for Jesus. There's still no room for Jesus in society, in our schools, in many of our homes, and most lives, and sadly, in a lot of our churches. The question you and I need to answer for ourselves is this. If you're watching today and you're in his house. Have we made room for Jesus in our hearts? He was on one and thin, and for the most part, he is still on one and now. He was laid in a manger because of a connection with us. I'm going to give you that. When Jesus allowed himself to be laid in that manger, he was identifying himself with those he came to save. There are three great areas of human lives that Jesus came to identify with. The first one is he knows our lack and he knows about our hardships. He knows about our needs. 2 Corinthians 8 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for the sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. He knows our poverty and has promised to meet our needs. 
Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Psalm 37 and 25 says, I have been young, and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. And then he knows about our problems. He knows about our struggles. Isaiah 53 and 3 says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help, to help in time of need. Jesus is like us because he experienced a full range of temptations through his life as a human being. We can be, com we can be confident knowing that Jesus faced temptation. We can be confident that he sympathizes with us. We cannot... Let me put it this way. We can be encouraged knowing that Jesus... <laughs> Face temptation without giving in to sin. He shows us that we do not have to sin when facing the seductive lure of temptation. Jesus is the only perfect human being who ever lived. Not Buddha, not Allah of the Islamic faith, not Confucius, and certainly not the Dalai Lama. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people think the Dalai Lama is perfect. But guess what? He's human just like everyone else. Verse 16. Let's us know that prayer is our approach to God and we are to come boldly to him. Some Christians approach God meekly and with their heads hung low. They're afraid to ask him to meet their needs. Others pray flippantly, giving little thought to what they say. But the thing is here, we need to come with reverence and respect to God because he is our king. But also come with bold assurance and expectation because he is our friend and our counselor. The love of our souls and he's our burden bearer. He knows that the trials and tribulations we face, and he has identified himself with them. Therefore, let me tell you this, he's able to help us through our troubles and meet the needs of our lives. That is one of the benefits of knowing Jesus Christ, our Savior. And if you agree, someone say amen. He also sees mankind's priorities. He hated and, and, and Jesus hated and disliked worldly splendor. He didn't like pageantry. He didn't like riches. When Jesus came to this world, he knew that, that mankind was basically greedy and in love with wealth, in love with riches, in love with luxury and the pursuit of it. He knew that man would be in the pursuit of high fashion, big mansions, and expensive vehicles. He knew that man would pursue high position and self-esteem, high self-esteem and the hunger of it. He came to teach us that there is a higher priority in life. And that priority is the glory of the Father. Luke said this about Jesus in Luke 16 and 15. He said to them, 
You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. He was born in that humble manger to remind men that the greatest aspiration of the human soul is to seek the glory of the almighty God ahead of everything else. Matthew 6 and 33 says this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness means to put God first in your life. To fill your thoughts with his desires and to take his character for your pattern of life. And to serve and obey him in everything. Let me ask you a question. If you're in this house and if you are listening today, what is really important to you? People, objects, goals, wealth, and other desires, and other desires that compete for priority. Any of these can quickly become most important to you if you don't actively choose to give God first place in every area of your life. And then he was laid in a manger because of accessibility. Now I want you to imagine something with me here for a moment. Imagine something here. Imagine this. Imagine for a moment that Jesus had been born in Herod's palace in the middle of all the riches and finery of that place. Imagine that his bed had been a golden crib. Imagine him having enjoyed a life of abundance and plenty. Imagine him being separated from the common man by the walls and guards of the king palace. Just imagine him having the finer things and advantages of life while the poor and the destitute were suffering. If that were the case, would you feel the liberty to come to him? Probably not. However, he was born in a manger and thereby he made himself accessible and available to all who would come to him. Luke chapter 2 records of the visit from the shepherds. These common, dirty, vowed men who were uneducated felt the liberty to approach him in this place. Later, even the wise men, these learned, educated, wealthy men felt equally at home bowing before him. I'm certain that one of the reasons Jesus avoided and rejected the palace in favor of the stable is so that he will be available to all who desire to come to him. We can thank and praise God that whoever will, whosoever will, can find all they will ever find or ever need in Jesus. From the lowliest person to the most influential ruler, all people have a right to come to Jesus. Amen? Revelations 22 and 17 says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. You know, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, he told her of the living water that he could supply. This image is used again as Christ invites anyone, anyone, anyone to come and drink the water of life. The gospel is unlimited in scope. All people everywhere no matter who you are 
no matter your financial background or your education. Black, white, blue, green, purple, polka dot, beige, bronze, whatever you are, you may come. See, see, salvation cannot be earned, but God gives it freely to whosoever will. We live in a world desperately thirsty for living water, and many are dying of thirst, but it's still not too late. Let me tell you, it's not too late. Let us invite everyone to come and drink. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 6, 37 says this, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Let me tell you something. Jesus did not independently, did not work independently of God the Father, but in union with him. This should give us even more assurance of being welcomed into God's presence and being protected by him. And then he was laid in a manger because it was an announcement to the world. When, when, when Mary took her newborn baby and, and, and placed him in that feeding trough. You know, she was painting an image far more powerful and, and brighter than she realized. For there in Bethlehem, the house of bread, the, the, the bread of life was born. The bread of life was born. Isn't it appropriate that the one who would feed the souls of countless masses and multitudes of people should have as his bed the very place where animals came to be fed? It just serves to remind us that when hungry men come to Jesus and receive him, he satisfies their yearning and hunger for their souls and gives them the bread of life. It was almost as if God were saying, dinner is served. Come and eat. Someone say, praise the Lord. And as I conclude this message today, I told you I wanted to come to the point. If you're watching today, or in the sanctuary, I think the birth of Jesus on this earth is a pretty significant event. I'm glad it happened as it did because in it, I find there's room for me and there's room for you to come to him and be saved by his grace. If you're watching today and you're in the house, do you know this this morning? No matter who you are today, rich or poor, black or white, tan or bronze, he has room for you. Whether you have a PhD or a grade school certificate or none of that, he has room for you. Whatever you did or do, did or did not do in the past, he has room for you. There's no excuse for not knowing Jesus and not having him in your life today. Why don't you receive the greatest gift this Christmas with the gift of salvation? If you're listening to this message today, you honestly need Jesus in your life and you know that you do. I ask you, why don't you make the decision today? to receive Jesus 
Now I mean today. Today, today, because tomorrow is not promised to us. If you're in a house, how many know tomorrow's not promised? He can give us new direction, make you into a new creation, and make you into a new person. And I got tons of people in this house who can testify of that. He'll give you eternal life and a one way ticket to heaven. He's knocking at the door of your heart today. Why don't you meet him now because you don't want to meet him later. And if you're in this house today and you know Jesus made an impact and made you a new creation, raise your hands today if you know that today. Aren't you glad that he did that today? I'm so glad when I was three years old that the Lord gave me a new walk. And some will say, three years old, you didn't know anything about life. Well, when we were born, we were born sinners. And the Lord gave me a new life. And I'm so grateful that I am a testimony of that today. My mama made me, and it wasn't no choice. It was either church or the other thing. She made sure I was in church and made sure that I knew who Jesus was. But at the age of three, I saw my sisters, my big sisters, shout. And I saw the church rejoicing and knowing God. And I said, Mama, what is that? I want that. My mom introduced me to Jesus. And the rest of my life is history. I'm grateful that I know Jesus. How about you? If you don't know Jesus today and you're watching, I want you to know that Jesus wants to come into your life. For this Christmas, receive the greatest gift you ever need, and that's the gift of salvation. And I pray that the Lord will give you that gift today. If you're watching, I want to pray with you and ask you to bow your heads with me. And if you truly believe in Jesus Christ that he died and rose again from the dead, you can be saved. The Bible tells us that. We here in Glad Tidings, we want to pray with you. All you just have to do is be sincere and have Jesus come into your life. Make this Sunday a banner day for you and for the rest of your life. He will make you into a new creation. And he's knocking at your door now. You know down deep and honest that you need Jesus today. I want you to make a decision for him. Let's pray. Say this with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity and this moment to say yes to you, to give my life to you, and to invite you into my heart. I ask you, Father, come into my heart. Come into my soul. Come into my mind. I want to serve you. I want to be saved. Save my life and my soul. I don't want to go to hell, but I want eternal life. Forgive me of my sins and my shame. Make me into a new creation. And I will serve you, Lord. Give me a new walk and a new talk. I say yes to you. Now, Lord, I thank you for forgiving me of my sins. I will serve you for the rest of my life. Bless me to find a church that loves Jesus 
a Bible-believing church, that I'll have a family that will help me to be a better Christian. Bless me, Lord, to read my Bible, to read about you, and have you in my life. I thank you for saving me. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand praise today. Hallelujah.